Seth, Bonacera. Welcome, buddy. How are we doing, Scott? Coming to, coming to me from across the world here. <laughs> yes, indeed. This is uh, actually not our first. Yeah, it's our first international stream here. Uh, so welcome uh, from, I'm in a little town called Salerno, Italy, which is about maybe a couple hours south of Naples, right? Which is uh, south of Rome. So if you kind of like, not on the boot, but kind of the, almost to the boot of Italy. In the shoelaces. And, <laughs> in the shoelaces. And I just got to tell you this, man. I just went with my, my good friend here to a very small restaurant we had heard about called Mama Rosa's. Okay. Like mama, like a mom. And it's this seafood restaurant in this little fishing village we're at. And I go down there and I sit and I didn't realize that she actually exists. Like Mama Rosa is actually the proprietor. She's, she's, like, it's just not the name, right? Like Mama Me or something. So I'm sitting down there. And for those who don't know, I, I'm a strict, like, you know, plant-based diet. And she goes, like, what are you going to have? And I'm like, oh, you know, I just don't eat fish. And she looked at me and she's like, I don't understand. Like, what do you mean? Like, you don't like, you know, like this type of fish, like swordfish, you want like more shrimp? And I was like, no, like none of it. And then she's like, what about cheese? I'm like, oh, no, no, I don't really eat that. <laughs> she just like asked for wine and I wasn't drinking alcohol. And she looked at my friend and just goes like, where is this guy from? Like, <laughs> why is America. he here? <laughs> and like, why is he here? And then like the food came and I wasn't eating all of it. She just basically put a, like a stack of vegetables on a plate and like threw it at me. And I'm just sitting there going like, oh, it's, it's good to be back in Italy, you know? That's so friendly too. That's yeah. You, you mama Rosa, not a fan of you in your style. Next time we'll trade places. I will make sure that I eat properly when I visit there. Dude, and I, I, was, I was like, Oh, I'm Seth. We're here. You're just like eating the fish and everything. Um, oh, yeah. And as I know, when you came to visit Tokyo, like there was no mercy on you, man, you were eating live fish almost. Um, but yes. anyways, <laughs> well, greetings, buddy. Well, today it's, it's a really exciting topic because it, it, to me, the, I, the, the topic of best use of sampling brings so much to mind about the crossover of rock and roll, which we often talk about, to almost like modern music, uh, EDM and hip hop uh, primarily. And Seth, when you think about sampling in your fandom of music, what, what do you think about? Like, what is the first thing that comes to mind when you think of sampling? Totally. My brain immediately goes to hip hop, I think. Um, I like all of the songs I grew up on. I remember hearing them, whether it was, you know, Jay-Z songs, Kanye West songs, yeah. hearing them and kind of knowing that they were clipped from somewhere else. And you could even kind of tell it was older music. And then kind of the more I dug into music later in life, you'd find them like those songs would pop up in the wild and you'd be like, oh, I know that hook. I don't quite know why I know it, but I'm familiar with it. And so I almost came to it from an unscientific way of having it bleed into other songs I already knew and then backing into the origin of them uh, by accident. So that's kind of where my brain goes of it, it's never not been a part of music for me. And so I know people have different opinions on sampling, kind of the, the validity of it musically, whatever. Although I think for the most part, it's swung in the positive direction. But for me, like I said, it's always been intrinsic to the music I've listened to. And so um, I'm, I'm very pro sampling and, and I've seen kind of how much can be done with a very small amount of, you know, loops from songs, drum beats, things like that. Oh, definitely. I think I find it so exciting because I feel more relevant. You know, it's like this bridge to the, you know, almost to the younger generation where, for example, when we were living together out in, you know, the Mesh Lab in, in Chicago, my little cousin, my little cousin interned, and he would show me these, you know, new hip hop songs and he's like, oh, I really like this part of the song. I'm like, actually, man, that's a Steely Dan sample. He's like, yeah. what are you talking about? And I got, and so he was interested when I showed him, like, this is where it originally came from. And then there was this yes. interest in not only, you know, the original, not the original song, but the Kanye song, for example. Uh, but here's the Steely Dan sample and here's the band Steely Dan. And so it was a great connect uh, connection, you know, and, and I, I really thought that was cool. Absolutely. And I think Kanye is kind of one of the most prolific, especially earlier in his career, where it was, it almost speaks to like the musical knowledge of the producer, because it's, these are, I mean, there are some like Steely Dan's obviously a very popular group in that, off that song champion you're talking about, but there are these like very, very deep cut 
hooks of songs you kind of never heard of or really obscure artists where, you know, they put out one album in the 60s and someone dug it out of a crate. It kind of ties into our Northern Soul discussion we had a few months ago where um, it's almost like you show you get your cred by finding these really obscure hooks from these songs that maybe people don't otherwise know. Sometimes they're very obvious and they're used as um, like an homage to the original song and very much feeding on the sound that people already know. But other times it's like these little loops or these little hooks or these little choruses that um, that are from songs that are otherwise kind of like lost to time. And a and producer is able to find them, dig them out and sort of use the guts of them to build something completely new. So I, I think it's a fascinating genre, if you could call it that. Um, yeah. And I'm, I'm psyched to dig into it today. <laughs> well, let me ask you another follow up question. Are there any ex- example, like sample examples that you don't like that you feel is maybe too extreme like too much of the original yeah like, so the one that jumps to mind for me and once again we we always he seems to come up a lot on the show but um the kid rock song all summer long oh, which is geez. basically just like it's like a straight <laughs> clip it's somehow they managed to combine two awesome songs and make a worse version of it but it's like such a clip of that iconic yeah. sweet home alabama guitar part and then the piano from werewolves of london and it's a bummer because it's not a creative use of it at all. It's just like a we're going to hit you with double nostalgia and you'll you'll your ears will like it because they like the songs they're from. But we're going to make it appreciably worse. So to me, that's like a not a bad use of sampling and that it was effective. But it's like not it's such a it's it's like lifted so whole cloth yeah. that it's there's no original production on it, in my opinion. So it's almost like you just want to say, hey, man, just label it a cover. Yeah. Just do a yeah. cover song and that will just actually pay it more respect. And, uh, but it's like this little kind of sneaky halfway thing. I, I agree. I always found like P Diddy or Puff Daddy, whatever. Uh, he went too far. It was almost like 90% of the song. It would be like you and I writing a song we put on police uh, yeah. every breath you take and we just go, Hey Seth, what's up? Yeah. And we just sort of rap over it <laughs> and then record yeah. it. No, that's a great example because it's not even a change in like the speed of the song and even the hook is the same more or less. So that's another one where it's just like, it's like you said, it's closer to cover than original composition using parts. Because I think the most interesting usage is when you're kind of, you know, mining these songs for lack of a better word, like spare parts and building them back into something completely different. And that's the most fascinating thing to deconstruct it. But if you're just lifting a song, like, that's it's such it's um, I, I sure hope Sting got paid a lot off of that one because yeah, I was such a, say. an abuse of a good song. Yeah. <laughs> well, where did so if we talk about sampling stuff, where did it begin? It, yeah. You know, uh, we mentioned hip hop and and EDM, but it, it goes way back before that. Absolutely. So the, the most people trace the origin of it back to the 1940s. This guy Pierre Schaefer was using this very weird technique. Yeah. It was called musique concrete. And it was more like experimental sounds than sampling, but he was pulling things from other places, putting loops together. Um, weirdly, I I I read Paul McCartney was a big fan of this too. Like he would make these weird little videos where he like, cut, which ended up being used on songs like "Tomorrow Never Knows" and later yeah. on on like the White Album things like that. But he would make these funny little videos of like, um, you know, just speeding up traffic in the street and putting weird sounds over them. So people mm-hmm. were experimenting with it in a very manual way as, as far back as the forties. Um, but it really became usable to kind of modern musicians in the seventies with um, the launch of a machine called the Fairlight CMI is what I kind of learned about this. It was the very early, very primitive version of a sampler, but it was groups. I mean, artists you've heard of people like Herbie Hancock, Peter mm-hmm. Gabriel, Duran Duran and even Kate Bush, who's having like the, the biggest summer of all time out of nowhere with her, her song running up the hill. But um, th- those were kind of early adopters and experimental musicians. I think Herbie Hancock especially gets a lot of credit for like being avant garde and bringing that into pop music. Um, yeah. So, you know, that's it. That once that happened, it was really off to the races. And then in the 70s with the you know late 70s, early 80s, the, the, the taking off of hip hop is good. And that's a genre that is kind of built on sampling. You know, we talked about the Sugar Hill Gang, which we'll get to, um, yeah. but that was kind of the origin story of it. And then it just became very commonplace once the technology caught up to the concept. Yeah, when you go, at, you know, we talked about hip hop and that was my first exposure to sampling where 
uh, especially with the Sugar Hill Gang and, and subsequently with the Beastie Boys, where it's like, oh, I know that song. And it was almost like bragging to your friends, see that? That's a Led Zeppelin track or that's from this, you know. And uh, But with Sugar Hill Gang in 1979 with Rapper's Delight built on the entire song of Good Times by the band Cheek. I mean, yeah. it was, uh, you know, the, the the legal story behind it was was interesting. As Sheik eventually sued uh, Sugar Hill Gang and they actually, I think, got co-writing credits it's like yeah. literally it wasn't even copyright it's like we both wrote this song together yeah. um uh but i thought the um obviously the the rationale behind it and when you look at the interviews like why did hip-hop rely on sampling especially in its you know, formative years a lot of it was they said it was money they just you couldn't afford a horn section you know yeah. an orchestra you couldn't afford this guitarist so it was almost like a DIY um, reaction. Say, hey, man, well, I don't need to actually outsource this to a big studio and spend all this money. I'm just going to sample this horn section or this drum beat. Uh, and especially as you use the, the turntable technology was becoming more and more sophisticated. Uh, I think that really kind of made sampling like just another tool. Yeah, it's fascinating kind of this idea of, um, you know, it's, it's necessity is the mother of invention. <laughs> and how a, like really a whole genre was was built on that. And there's also the famous story where um, and this is true. This is not like apocryphal, I don't think, is the New York City blackouts in 1980. All of a sudden, everybody could do sampling because they just like stole all the shit from stores. And, and all, all, we went from a very few people who had turntables and had, you know, samplers and had the setup to very many people like democratized yeah. hip hop very quickly. Um, and like I said, that's a true story. But uh, being able to kind of have that concept, find records that no one else had and create sounds and loops at, at parties that um, were really original, uh, very much lines up with that Northern Soul idea of like, how can, I, how can I use the resources that I've got to do something creative and new? Um, and now they pushed so, so far beyond that. And you and I could do yeah. um, an album. Why don't, actually, Scott, why don't you talk a little bit about your experience with that? Like kind of, you know, finding songs, putting hooks together. I know you weren't yeah. kind of building things from scratch but yeah i mean one of my first yeah. one of my first uh when i was learning how to dj uh and one of my first sets i used the two samples i had actually three turntables and i put the back beat i looped of uh, billy jean dun dun and then i put over that the saxophone of smooth operator by the some artist sade and then oh, yeah. added a house beat and people went ballistic. Right. And I was like, well, it's, you know, it's curating it essentially. And there is an art to the mix, but that they, they recognize it. I was definitely piggybacking off of these equities. Uh, I, again, I, I'd say, you know, as you and I said, we've started companies and whatnot and to create from scratch is very difficult. So I, I definitely, although I think the DJ is an amazing artist in a way I, i'd still say it, it's not the same as creating from scratch so i give those djs that give a lot of credit you know hey i took this sample from here i mixed it as opposed to creating where a lot of people don't know they look at the modern djs like oh they just made this yeah um, but i think you hit the nail on the head of that idea of like borrowing these equities and that's like a very like businessy way to say it but i think it's <laughs> i think it is a really good way to think about it because you are you're like as long as i can build something interesting off of this i've already got people hooked with the sound they're familiar with and yeah. simply by recognizing it they feel like they're like in on the fun or something you know what i mean like they're like oh i get yeah. this i i can speak to the fact that i'm familiar with it so yeah. um yeah and obviously that became uh you know that this was a really cool concept but i think that the, you you um you talked about it a little bit with Chic, but yeah. kind of people trying to figure out, all right, how the hell do we add some structure around this so people can sort of properly get paid on it? Um, because initially it was just like, it was the Wild yeah. West and there was no way to, to yeah. give proper credit to people's work that kind of built the song. Um, and that was until 1991. There were two cases a few months apart. Um, one was Biz Markey versus Gilbert O'Sullivan, which is a weird pairing. Um, another <laughs> yeah. one was... Another one was the Turtles, you know, the band that does So Happy Together um, yeah. in De La Soul. And both of those were kind of, uh, the, the, in both cases, the original songwriters were given writing credit and significant amounts of money, which sort of set the precedent 
for music going forward and how music sampled, how artists are credited. And that yeah. kind of remains up to this day. So this big thing that's been in the news recently that I wanted to mention was uh, Beyonce just put out an album resurrection or not resurrection. What's it called Renaissance like yep. about two or three weeks ago. And a big stink was made because one of the song had 24 writers and people are like, Oh my God, you know, does that take away from the artistry? But the yeah. very short answer from that is it sampled three different songs within it. And that added up to like seven writers right there. And then obviously yeah. she's got a million producers, but um, this idea where it's sort of like this layer cake of, you know, mm -hmm. pieces you're bringing together. But then unfortunately the pie gets divvied up pretty quickly where if you're getting 1% yeah. of writing credits, if it's Beyonce, she gets away with it because she's going to have a billion streams of that song. Yeah. But I know there's there's other artists that have literally scrapped songs because the clearance to get approval and the, the, the benefit from the songwriting credits is not enough to justify the work to go do it and sample it and pay people out. So it really has the business around sampling has really calcified um, versus where it was in the beginning. And it's 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 pretty, pretty intense the way it's 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 managed. So um, when you see it, know that that artist you hear is at least, uh, you know, getting some benefit from from a song being hit. Definitely. And especially when you look at the early days, uh, let's just say in the 80s, kind of this heyday when hip hop was just kind of coming into its own and uh, everyone was sampling Funky Drummer by, uh, you know, um, by James Brown. You had the Winstons who did uh, Amen Brother, which is the most sampled drum beat in hip hop. It's a six second segment that we'll play it on our on our social media but yeah. literally it is like the default drum beat of hip hop and those guys didn't get the same contracts as you mentioned as now Beyonce and and the business now knows how to monetize it they know like we know when you're going to sample this that can make your song a hit and we want a piece of it and i actually agree with them because same and, and I, I think it's a very fair system and it allows the artist to go, well, uh, we can borrow this proven equity, but here's the price. And the bigger the kind of success of that song, like Sweet Home Alabama, they're like, hey, man, that's a success. You just can't get that for free um, yeah. or then trying to build it on your own. So I think it's a, it, it's kind of coming to a, a fair thing. But uh, I do see like the early example with like Paul's Boutique by the Beastie Boys in 89. That was, I think... Um, very, very interesting use. There were over a hundred some samples. Uh, literally, it was almost a collection of sampling. Um, but at the time, they could get them super cheap. And the Dust Brothers, who had produced it, uh, they said they couldn't do it now. It, it just would be yeah. cost prohibitive, yeah. uh, which is you know good and bad in a way. Yeah, it's a fascinating story. It's changed. It's like the structure around it has changed the use of samples, mostly for the better. But it mm -hmm. is a little bit creatively stifling. But it's like you said, it's kind of a songwriter decision of like, well, I can yeah. use this. It's going to cost me. Do I want to do that? Or do I want to go back to the drawing board and kind of rethink how I'm building the song or the producer or whatever? So yeah. um, I think a little bit of stifled creativity to make sure that people are getting paid for the work they did is more than mm -hmm. fair. So I agree with you that I think what it has turned into now is a fairly equitable system. And I think most people would agree with that in the industry. Yeah. And I think that just the whole, if you go back to like the concept of a cover, right? I think different interpretations of a song, like we talked about Joe Cocker doing amazing covers of the Beatles and the Beatles liked it because it was a new expression. Yeah. Uh, but then obviously the payment systems, you know, reflect that, you know, the creation versus value, whatever. Uh, but I think the sampling, especially like you get the Kid Rock, I agree with you, man. Like you go to him and you're like, come on, dude. Like you're, what would Leonard Skinner say to this? Or they're, they're going to be like, you know, at least pay me, pay me a yeah, lot. It's just Rock. lazy. It's just, it's totally just lazy. Yeah. That's yeah. what I find. Like do something original. Uh, yeah. But hey, you know, it, it, it must have made Kid Rock so much money that he was able to pay half of that. Uh, totally to to the to the original bands but what so seth as we talk about some of these examples we talk about paul's boutique and some of the albums that came out and even you know james brown or or the, the kind of the winston's is legendary drum beat but what songs would you put on as kind of seminal or paragons of sampling the the, the best best examples yeah. So the one I think you've got here, which is great, is um, Edge of 17 by Stevie Nicks. I think this yeah. was her very first single off her first solo album or definitely yeah. one of her first one of the first. 
Um, but you know, it's got that very distinctive, like kind of guitar chugging in the beginning, which is the piece that a lot of people lift. And you could just loop that for a whole song, which we've seen happen. I think the big one that I always think of is Bootylicious by Destiny's Child. I mean, yeah. that was another one that 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 was the the foundation of the song. But then they did kind of do other things with it. and it, But it's always kind of, it's just chugging along in the background of the whole song. Yeah. It gives it its pace. It gives it its energy. Um, but I mean, it's used in a Miley Cyrus song. Um, it tends to pop up here and there. And it, for the most part, a pretty good usage of it. And it, again, just like taking that building block um, yeah. and creating something new out of it. So I think that's a good, a, 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 something that comes up often and is for a good reason. It's, it's a great starting point to kind of build your song off of. How about you? For me, one that I found very interesting was Warren G and Nate Dogg's Regulator. Yeah. Uh, and, and this is in you know the 90s. They're doing that G-Funk kind of Long Beach uh, hip hop scene. And they used Michael McDonald's, I keep forgetting, this iconic bass line and iconic synthesizers. And I read a story as I, I was very curious, as, as you know, I'm a huge Michael McDonald fan. Yes. And Warren G. You know, African-American coming from uh, Long Beach, California, you know, you're kind of like, okay, so how did this happen? And he said, growing up, which we're a similar age in the early eighties, uh, he loved that song. And he said, I love that song so much. I wanted to integrate it into this message I wanted to say. And I thought that was very authentic and very, um, I guess, as I said before, this, this bridge between, perhaps two cultures that don't really, you wouldn't say on the surface, listen to each other. Right. I don't yeah. think, I don't know if Michael McDonald's super into G rap, you know, totally. G funk. Uh, and I thought even with Stevie Nicks, you know, kind of this difference of cultures. And that's what I find so funny. You're getting guys like uh, Nas that are listening to nine inch nails that are sampling uh, De La Soul going from uh, blood, sweat and tears, like even obscure kind of Anglo music. But using yeah. it brilliantly. And that's when I go, okay, there's something good to this sampling. Totally. Kanye West using Elton John. You know what I mean? It, <laughs> it, but it shows, I also think it does something else, especially in hip hop, where it shows you the broadness of influence of these musicians. Of like, I, yeah. For whatever reason, I think a lot of people, myself included, kind of think of like, there's like tradition, well, like, you know, um, guitar, drums, bass music over here and hip hop over here and kind of never yeah. the two shall meet. And that's really not the case. Like, just like anything else, people are influenced by their surroundings, what they hear, yeah. what they grew up on. And so I think showing this broad swath of music they're drawing from influentially, or I don't even know if that's a word, but kind of, you know, getting influenced by yeah. and bringing it into songs. I think it's almost just like you think of this as a, its own standalone genre, but actually they're drawing from all these different inspirations. And this is what the result of it is. But I, once again, I think it just shows how broad, um, and how rich the knowledge of the history of music some of these guys have, producers-wise. So, um, a great example of that, yeah. Now, why don't you see, Seth, it going the other way, from hip-hop going into more mainstream, say, rock and roll? I think it's, it's the short answer is, I think a lot of rock and roll is doesn't use as much sampling because it's mm -hmm. all, it's kind of like, you know, original instrumentation production. But I yeah. think as sort of like rock and pop and hip hop and EDM sort of are getting swirled into one. Like I think yeah. more and more that music, like go listen to the top 40 in those, a lot of those songs are um, kind of defy genre a little bit. They're kind yeah. of a little bit of everything. So standalone rock, it's tougher to sample because you're playing it live, I would say, but, yeah. but I think more and more, as those lines get blurred, you are seeing much more a blending of different styles of music. I think some of it too is remember, like when you're talking about hip hop, you're before 1980, let's say there was no hip hop to draw upon. There's yeah. only like this cache of rock and roll or whatever other kinds of music um, as where uh, rock that's, it's kind of, when you flip it, it's not the case. There's not as much of a, a sort of a backlog to go dig into and yeah. the backlog of hip hop you're digging into is sampling rock music. So it's like the snake eating its tail a little bit, right? Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think that's some of the reason. But I don't. I don't think it's for lack of, um, uh, you know, creative credibility. I think it's just kind of it's it works as a bit of a one way street. But that that yeah. is starting to change a bit. One thing that I saw was really interesting was Robert Plant of of course the frontman of Led Zeppelin. He uh, 
had a solo hit called Tall Cool in, in, in 88. And he infuses Led Zeppelin samples within the song from the ocean and black dog. And, hey, hey, mama. And yeah. I asked him like, hey, you're using Led Zeppelin. Sampling. And he said, you know, everyone's sampling Zeppelin. So why can't I? And I thought that was a brilliant, <laughs> like, you know, it's almost like you have these artists like Ellen John that have spanned decades. They can almost sample their earlier stuff, just like a hip hop artist does and use it in their current songs. Yeah, uh, no, that, that- that's that's hilarious. And like you said, why not? It, it makes complete sense. It reminds me of the story, which isn't quite <laughs> sampling, but um, I I forget. It was run through the jungle and old man down the road. But after CCR broke up, the it, or basically John Fogarty left CCR. He yeah. put out a song and they sued him because he sounded too much like himself because they're <laughs> like, this song sounds just like the CCR song. And he's like, I wrote that song. Like, it's crazy. Yeah. So that you do see kind of effective usage of, of one's own material. If you go back, and the, those are two kind of funny examples. But yeah, I know recent- at one point, I think <laughs> that that Robert Plant song was the intro for the show, if I'm not mistaken. Am I right? That's that? right. That's right. Yeah. And I thought it was just so brilliant how he was able to sample his own songs, uh, which is kind of, you know, you make fun of the whole thing. Like, oh, like, for example, if Sting resampled P. Diddy's track, about every breath you take and it said hey well you can do it to me why can't i do it to you another one that was funny was um rakim no no uh it was uh peter guns and lord rakim uh this bronx lord, lord Tariq and peter lord Tariq, Tariq. yes right. yeah. they used one of my favorite bands of course steely dan and the song black cow but they did not ask steely dan at all it's this classic story where they're just like oh we love this song and they literally took the entire track uh recorded it the management company released it and then steely dan sued and said like uh yeah guys you just Sorry, you can't do that. Can't it was like a yeah. just like a shock. But recently, I thought with like Kendrick Lamar's 2017 hit "Loyalty," sampled a song almost uh, as a contemporary from Bruno Mars, which was I think 24 uh, 24K Love um, and or 24K Magic. Yeah, and that I thought was interesting. You saw that with uh, Eminem with his song "Stan" using Dido as literally the backing track and you kind of don't know which one came first uh yeah but the, you know the the it, you didn't have to go way back to the obscure 70s to 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 yeah. find a sample it's like both songs they could play back to back on the radio hypothetically <laughs> right like yeah. they're, they're contemporaneous and that that piece is pretty new actually i think you're right about that yeah like that's pretty that's a pretty new phenomenon but an interesting one well so. what would you say seth if you were uh sample that you felt really added to the song as one that you think you could have just taken it out and it would have been a lot better. Who? So you're saying if, if the sample wasn't in there, like it somehow brings the song down. Yeah. Like if you heard a song and it, and it relied so heavily on a sample that you just felt like it, it just took away because the, the personality of that sample just overpowered the, yeah, uh, uh, the original song. It's I, I don't know if I have a specific example in mind, but that concept you're talking about, I'm fully aware of where mm-hmm. it's almost like the song is good. And then like, there'll be a voice sample or something. It almost like takes mm-hmm. you out of the song. You're like, it kind of drops in from the sky. And it once again, feels a little bit kind of, I don't know if Craven's the right word, but it's like, why, why did yeah. it feels really bolted on? I think the yeah. best versions of samples are ones that are really cleanly integrated into the song structure or built around it rather than like kind of tacking it on top. And the ones that, that feel thrown on top are the ones that, uh, that, that kind of throw me off because again, it feels like you're pulling in, you're pulling it in just for the credibility of the song rather than being creative with it. So. Yeah. Yeah, I thought the, um, there's a couple, I thought Madonna's hung up, which sampled from, uh, gimme, gimme, uh, from ABBA. I thought that was, it was so powerful. The sample, that it, I thought it just overpowered Madonna. I, I thought yeah. it was just I, kind of similar to this, uh, uh, you know, Kid Rock, where it's like, hey, I think that could have been a song there. There could have been something really interesting, but yeah. it's essentially an ABBA remix. Yeah, if I was going to say, if you flip on the radio and it takes you like 15 seconds to figure out which version it is, to yeah. me, that's too much, right? That's like, you're just true. And that's a, an example of, for a while, I thought of that 
like the da-na-na, da-na-na, that the main yeah, part yeah. was originally a Madonna song, actually, yeah. which is almost like the, <laughs> the most mortal sin you can commit. And then hearing the original, I was like, oh, this is so much better. So that was, yeah. I mean, that's one person's opinion. But I think when it be it, when it sort of subsumes the whole song, that's a that's a, like that poor, lazy, whatever you want to say it. It's kind of piggybacking on something people already like in a way that's not even creative. So that's my my two cents. So last question here, Seth. Before yeah. we, uh, I, gra- I grab another of my thirtieth uh, cappuccino of the day here in, in, in <laughs> Italy. What sample would you like to hear? What you probably like a rock sample that you would like someone to integrate? Oh boy, you always put me on the spot with these types of questions. I'm trying. <laughs> always to the last question, Seth. Just to, to yeah, I don't, I will once again. I'll dodge it, but I'll just say my favorite usage of samples and one I'd like to see more is people really digging into that like late 60s, early 70s funk phase, which I think is starting to come back around a little bit. Like I said, Kanye West was like, did only that for a while and now doesn't do it at all, which is, that's a criticism of it. He's even like referenced it in songs. But I think there's so much like character in those songs. And there's a lot of them that are very obscure and kind of have been caught up, you know, have have found Mm -hmm. um, what comes back to the Northern Soul thing, once again, as we always do. But it um, kind of being able to pull out some of those really hooky parts and build something else out of them. To me, that's like a toolkit that never gets empty. I think that's yeah. a great place to start. What, do, what are you thinking? Gosh, I, you know, I, I hate to say it, it sounds so boring, but I would love to hear a, re, a, a sample of the part of Hey 19 from Steely Dan, where it's, <laughs> it says the Cuervo gold, the fine Colombian make tonight a wonderful thing. It's a beautiful part that I love. And I'm so surprised that a hip hop artist hasn't taken that. Obviously there's, um, it alludes to cocaine, <laughs> to drugs, it's, you know, and, and tequila, whatever, but it's, uh, it, it's just a beautiful uh, just a beautiful hymn that I just absolutely love it. I'm just waiting. So anyone out there, please, for me. Take it. <laughs> M- but, Mr. Mr. Non-Drinking Vegan would like you to do a song about tequila and cocaine. So yeah, please fire yeah. that up for him. <laughs> just for the Steely Dan. Well, listen, yeah. everyone. Hey, thank you so much. Uh, Seth, you got to tell people what's going on uh, in your world now. The, we had Lollapalooza. You're obviously a big success. I, I'm now the backstage guy, apparently. So you're, you're in front of the camera now. What do we have coming on soon? Yeah, it's, it's exciting stuff. So that Lollapalooza has given us a little credit, seems. So we were able, or I was able to get um, a media pass for an event here in Chicago called Sacred Rose Festival. It's happening the last week of August, I think 26, 27, 28. Um, you've got artists like Phil Lesh, you've got Corey Wong, Dawes. It's kind of a funk slash rock leaning fest. Um, it's out in in Bridgeview. Um, and more detail to come. I'm hoping to get some interviews locked down um, and a little bit of a man on the street like we did at Lollapalooza. Um, but exciting stuff and a really cool festival. This is the first year of it. So um, more news to come. I think we're going to do a preview episode. But if sure. anybody wants to come out and uh, catch some bands with me, please uh, please give us a shout on social media and we'll, we'll, we'll make something happen. Looking forward to it. Congrats, Seth. That's awesome, buddy. Well, Hey, listen, everyone, buonanotte. Good night, uh, from Italy and Chicago. And, uh, we'll see you next week. Go eat some goddamn pasta, Scott. Get out of here. (laughs) And some meat. See you guys.